Chapter 4 of Joaquin the Claude Duval of California. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Joaquin the Claude Duval of California, or The Marauder of the Mines, a Romance Founded on Truth by Henry L. Williams. Chapter 4. On gaining the trysting place at Arroyo Cantuva, Joaquin found between three and four hundred horses driven in by his men. The latter were encamped and awaiting fresh instructions. The chief of the coyote selected a part to drive the captures into Sonora for the greater safety, and at the same time had sent one of his secret bankers in the same place five thousand dollars. About the end of the month, idleness began to grow heavy upon him, and he could bear inaction no longer. He took to the highway again, still accompanied by Gonzales, Felix, Cardoza, and the three young women, who formed, as they bestrode their steeds with limbs perhaps too plump and shapely, the prettiest trio of cavaliers that ever cantered into a maid's heart. For the first ten days, the gang met no persons except unlucky diggers changing off from one mine to another, who were, to a man, to be smelt of poverty a mile off. They were so redolent of lack of cash. Hence Joaquin's purse remained in so flat a shape that he determined to fall upon the first man, Chinaman or Jew, ex-soldier or ex-sailor, miner or speculator, or even a robber, for the wolf was so famished that it was ready to bite wolf. Towards dusk, a young man, Alan Ruddle, made his appearance, driving a wagon load of provisions. Joaquin left his friends, put his horse to the gallop, and, taking a shortcut, came upon the teamster suddenly. "'I'll trouble you to turn over to me all the cash you've got about you,' accosted he. Ruddle took a squint at the challenger, and, seeing a young blade who seemed to be only a novice at the worthy calling of Dick Turpin, Claude Duval, and Sixteen-String Jack, and in America, Mike Martin, he smiled to himself and took a fly off the rump of one of his horses with his heavy rawhide whip. Joaquin pushed forward alongside of him and, drawing his revolver then, commanded in a brutal, peremptory tone, Stand and deliver! Ruddle pulled up short. Now see here, my friend, said the young desperado in a gentler voice, all I want to do is borrow your money, for, though I am a toll-gatherer on the roads of my own taxes, I never like to relieve of his gold a brave man, and I am sure you are one to travel the roads alone. As true as my name's Joaquin, I will repay you every cent of what you lend me. Joaquin, eh? muttered Riddle, clapping his hand on the stock of his pistol. Joaquin made a threatening motion. Come, none of your nonsense, exclaimed he. I am not often shoal on the bar, and you may rely on my promise. I have no wish to kill you, but if you take the pop guns by Our Lady, you'll go toes up, most certainly. Ruddle was not the man to take a robber's advice when it related to a game that two could play at, and he tried to pull out his firearm, but the confounded hammer had worked into the lining of his pants, and he could not disengage it. At this moment, Reynard's Felix thundered on at a gallop in order to tell his leader to make haste, as two well-mounted strangers were coming up at full drive. "'To hell's flames with them!' swore the bandit, uncocking his colts and stuffing it into his case. At the same time, he flashed out his long knife, leaned over, and, dealing the wagoner a dreadful stab, fairly tore him from the saddle." Felix jumped down and turned out Alan's pockets, in which he found the moderate figure of four hundred dollars. Joaquin and his followers continued their way to meet newcomers. Before five minutes had elapsed, the latter came into view. Now, said Joaquin, we'll see what this hall will be. I won't stand any fooling this time. A prick of the spur made his horse spring forward in advance of his little band. The six holes of his revolver bearing on those approaching were sufficient, without the summons accompanying the movement, to prevail on them to draw rein. As the horses reared, one of the riders laughed and said, Why, hello, Joaquin, don't you know me? 
Is Bill Miller dead and under in your mind? By heaven, so it is you, said the Sonoran with a smile. I swear I didn't know you at first. That's a slapping bit of horse flesh between your legs, Bill. Oh, I'll bet you yes. You see, I've been picking out some good goers in Sacramento Valley. I'm going down into that beautiful Sonora of yours on a speck in horses. I'm dry as a mountain lake in summer, and I've got to raise some dough before long. The deuce, you say, Bill. You're a yank, to be sure. But you've always shown yourself to be a friend of mine. If a hundred will help you along the way, any? Ask. Here's the chink. It's yours. Thank you, my boy, said Bill, stowing away the sum. It's as good a windfall as if one of those big trees was blown down. Good luck till next time. Adios, amigo. Goodbye. Luck to you as well, returned the captain of the plunderers. Don't mind a man and some horses just above on the road. What then? The stupid fellow ran against a knife I had in my hand, that's all, added the young leader. <laughs> that's settled, and off went Miller and his companion their way, while the Mexicans went theirs. The murder of Alan Ruddle stirred up the embers again. To slay a man for four hundred dollars was held to be mighty mean. Now, one of the hot coals that news fanned into flame was Captain Harry Love of Pacific State Jack Hayes, who got the idea into his head of organizing on his own hook a little company to hunt the bold brigand. Since he had been able to reach a stirrup from the ground and to hold out a pistol, Harry Love had been in the life of a ranger. His whole existence had passed in braving fatigue and danger. He had rendered Uncle Sam great in many services during the Mexican War, where he had been the bearer of dispatch between the military stations, through a country as wild and dangerous as could be, naturally, besides being bountifully supplied with guerrillas and independent lancers. A coolness under fire that was unequaled, remarkable skill in handling rifle, six-shooter, and buoy, made him the man of all others to be fitted against a desperado of Joaquin's caliber. After Red Ale's murder, Captain Harry Love set out on the assassin's trail, and pursued him to the rancheria of San Luis de Gonzago, which served as the usual haunt of the coyotes. He got there after nightfall, and informed by a spy whom he had posted there that the men he sought were surely in a tent at the other end of the rancheria, he led his men cautiously in that direction. But before they arrived at the door, a woman in the next canvas house espied them and gave the alarm. Quicker than thought, Joaquin, Felix, and Gonzales and Cardoza made a slit in the back of the tent and slipped out and away under the cover of darkness. When Harry Love and his companions made a dash in through the front opening, they encountered, instead of a volley and a display of daggers, the feigned screams of surprise of four or five females, three of whom were mistresses of the chiefs of the despoilers. The captain was not aware of this fact, or he might have made hostages of them. He did not deem it well to press on the chase at this juncture, and let the thieves go quiet with the scare for this time. Meanwhile, the escaped four had fled straight as the crow flies to a place eight miles off, called Oris Timbers, where they took their revenge for being made fly and stealing about thirty fine horses, which they drove off into the highlands near at hand. On the following night, they returned to their light o' loves, who donned their masculine in all haste, and all turned again to the Sierra. They stayed there until dawn, after which the party crossed Tular Prairie to Los Angeles, driving before them the stolen cattle. On coming into the country of the Tejon Indians, they encamped on the brink of a brooklet something less than five miles from the chief village of that tribe. Everything seemed to promise that there was nothing to fear on the part of those redskins, next to the Paiutas, most inoffensive, unromantic, dirty, greasy, grubbing, ignoble children of the forest. So they stacked arms, so to say, and resolved for several days to do no other hard work than rest and have their fun. Now it chanced that one prowling savage, having snuffed rosing meat with his capacious nostrils, crept up to the Mexican camping ground, remarked their showy raiment, their profusion of jewelry, and the valuable horses that grazed around them, 
and ran off to the capital city and into the royal palace, an old gutta percha blanket and a piece of sailcloth stretched on poles, of the old Sagamore Zapatara, to whom he glowingly depicted the wealth of the pale faces. One evening, as Murrieta, Gonzales, and Felix, far from dreaming of danger, were amusing themselves with their fair but frail companions, and as Cardoza, stretched on the high grass, carelessly kept an eye on the cattle cropping choice tufts of herbage here and there, they were all surrounded and overpowered by a formidable crew of soiled aborigines, whose bonds, not exactly of friendship, but of unbreakable rawhide, speedily encircled them. If a dagger had glittered, or a pistol had gone off by accident, or even if a good fist blow had drawn blood from one son of the woodland's nose, ten to one the whole party would have whisked around and shot back on the warpath with antelope speed. But, inasmuch as nothing of the kind occurred, they were delighted at the unalloyed success of the enterprise, and leaves fell off the oaks at the deafening yell of joy that went up from the throng, dancing, kicking up behind and before, brandishing weapons unpleasantly under the captive's eyes, and almost kissing the lucky brother who had found out the fish and spread the net which had entangled them. Dragged to the headquarters of the valiant tribe, the prisoners were stripped, with an expertness which they, though good judges, might envy. They were stripped of jewels, arms, and clothing, being only permitted to preserve as offerings of respect to their modesty, several strips of cloth which were utterly useless to the savages. The Mexicans had the satisfaction of seeing old Zapatara circulate among the ravished squaws in three of their suits, one over the other. The other male garb went to the spy. The Indians, moreover, had reaped and gleaned a harvest, over and above the horses, of four thousand dollars in gold and half that amount in jewels. The lives of the robbers were also in their hands. For a whole long week, the venerable chieftain kept them prisoners of war, while he puzzled his elevated brain as to whether he should have them made living targets, have them shot, burnt, hanged, drowned, made to run the gauntlet, for which the voice of the women spoke, as their dear little boys hadn't had any sport of late, or what not. At last, mercifully considering that they must be sufficiently punished for the impudence of having entered his hunting grounds, he came to another conclusion. He called a council, and he had translated to the captives a long speech in which, after declaring himself almost ready to wash out in their blood the stain on his tribe put there by his having heard them curse them for rascally engines, he spread himself in moral reflections on the enormity and number of the crimes which they must have committed to have become possessed of such a great quantity of gold and jewels. Then he had them walked off Spanish to the confines of his realm, escorted by a detachment of his lifeguard, armed to the teeth with the knives and firearms laid of the Mexicans, where they were glad to be set free. End of chapter 4